evening to our viewers. Um, certainly some rooster tails there on tarmac, but tonight it's rooster tails in the desert. And, uh, well, everybody that knows me knows I love the red cars. Um, I've always been fond of the, the prancing horse, but I've never spoken to one. And tonight we have the privilege to actually speak to one. Clint, um, in the background, we've got Clint Lingerfeld as always the co-host. Hi. Hi, Patrick. Well, am, am I on the right track here? We're going to speak to a manufacturer tonight. No, for sure. But I, I just want to say to the audience that Patrick has got double standards. I always thought he's an alpha guy. Now nah, yeah, he's a Ferrari I, guy. <laughs> I am. I am. There's no denying the fact. I am an alpha man. But, but it, it's red and it's Italian, so I like it. <laughs> Same shoe, different sock, they say. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I've never heard of a Kalahari Ferrari, though. <laughs> Kalahari Ferrari. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so so tonight we're going to introduce our, our listeners and our viewers to a Kalahari Ferrari. A warm welcome to you, Ross Branch. Hey guys, uh, thanks so much for having me on the show. <laughs> Hi Ross. Ross. <laughs> Kick it hey off, guys, tell us. See you. <laughs> where did you get the name Kalahari Ferrari? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, being from Botswana, our uh, our main form of uh, transportation is a is a donkey cart. So, um, you know, during my desert races, we had a lot of locals here seeing uh, seeing me racing through the desert, and uh, they came up with the name that I'm a really fast donkey cart and a really <laughs> aggressive donkey cart. So it came up as a Kalahari Ferrari. So a really cool nickname, and uh, really proud and and privileged to have a name like that. Yeah. Absolutely. It's an, an, and now it's an international name. Everybody knows about the <laughs> Kalahari Ferrari. <laughs> I hope so. You know, we've been trying. We, we've been trying for a long time to get the name on the map. So hopefully it's working. <laughs> we were, we were going to have to start at the beginning here. Yeah. Um, yes. We want to introduce you from the word go. In other words, where yeah. does Ross Branch come from? Where did, where, how did you end up where you are? So we want to start at the very beginning. Take us to your very first introduction to any form of motorsport. Mm. <laughs> yes, that was so long ago. I can't remember. Eh? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I started I started racing motorbikes when I was three years old. Um, you know, we lived in a small town in Botswana called Joanne. And uh, it was it was amazing. You know, the best, uh, best lifestyle I've, I could ever ask for. And... Um, you know, living in a small mining town, uh, you know, the the only thing we had was basically some sports and, and racing motorbikes and stuff. And my dad was was really into the racing of bikes. So he got me a bike and it was a really uh, a awesome family adventure every day. You know, we got to go to the track and and work on everything. And uh, yeah, that's how it started. And I loved it from the beginning. You know, I was really young when I started and um, it was a family sport. My sister raced before me. And uh, we got to a certain age where my parents couldn't afford for both of us to race. So my sister decided to stop and, and I carried on racing, thank goodness. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very <laughs> grateful. You know, my parents made everything happen and uh, got me to where I am. And yeah, we still got a long way to go, but uh, definitely trying our best. And yeah, from the from the age of three, I, I pretty much knew what I wanted to do. You know, it's, it's weird sure. being such a young boy and, um, you know, knowing what you want to do and knowing your end goal. And I wanted to become a world champion of some sort, sort of racing. Um, so I set my sights on that. And at 15, I had to make a really big decision with my parents and to leave school and do homeschooling and go overseas. So I lived in Germany for five years racing the world championship and a couple of uh, German championship motocrosses. And uh, yeah, then from there, you know, I had to come home. Times got a little bit tough. My mom, unfortunately, got uh, fell ill with cancer. So, so I came home to be at home. And uh, you, yeah, stayed in South Africa racing for a while and started off road series with uh, KT South Africa. And um, yeah, you know, that led to to one thing. I won a championship. I wanted to win two championships before we made any other ideas of of going going anywhere else in the world to race. And uh, I won, ended up winning three championships. And I decided, listen, the, the next thing in line is Dakar Rally. So it's a dream. 1992, when I was six years old, my dad took me to uh, Kitman's Whip where we went to, went to go watch a... Uh, the Dakar come through, you know, where it was Perry Le Cap and it was incredible. And and from that day, I pretty much said, listen, I want to be one of those guys uh, doing this crazy adventure. And, uh, you know, a couple of years later, <laughs> um, I was there and uh, we managed to to get an entry into the 2019 um, 
Dakar with uh, with my championships from South Africa. So we went over there and I, I managed to do to do okay. Um, I won the You're best okay. rookie of the year, which was cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you know, I thought uh, I thought I'd left something on the line. So so you know, luckily, thank goodness that there were so many people that backed me and that that believed in me. So we managed to raise enough money to go back for a, a second year. And that was incredible. You know, I wanted to go and show show everybody, show the world that are that I think that everybody from Southern Africa that races off road racing has the speed to to do well at Dakar. And we managed to win a stage in in 2020, which was yeah. which was incredible. It was probably one of the best feelings in my life. You know, um, a race that was that was just a dream has now become a reality. And, and even more so, winning a stage was was incredible. And I think it it made everyone realize that. Okay, this guy, yeah, maybe maybe it's just a lucky stage win, but uh, we can go for it, and uh, we think he's got what he got what it takes. So, um, yeah, I raced twenty twenty. I raced a couple of uh, rounds of the the world championship rallies, and yeah, we did okay, top top ten, which was which was the goal. And uh, yeah, we had to make a really really big decision in October in in twenty twenty whether we're going to go to. Uh, to a factory team and and uh, you know Yamaha came up with a really good offer and it was a dream come true. I've always wanted to be on a factory team and I've I've always looked up to teams like that and uh, to riders that are on factory teams and how much effort we put in, you know. And um, it was a dream come true. So we went over to Yamaha and it was it was incredible. You know, unfortunately, with COVID, it uh, you know I couldn't go and do do many of the races, but uh, I trained I trained really hard and. Uh, yeah, got ready for Dakar 2021, and uh, we went over to Dakar. And, you know, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself. Uh, everyone else was like, "Hey, just listen, just go and be yourself." But I, I put all the pressure on myself to go and do as well as I possibly could. And uh, the first week was incredible. <laughs> I think everybody that supports me and that knows what's going on yeah. ex- knew exactly what's happening. So, so I was lying top five, which is exactly where I wanted to be. And and like I said, it was another dream come true. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, second week caught us out a bit, but. Yeah, all in all, um, yeah, I'm so grateful to to be where I am, and so grateful to have the people behind me that are are behind me and that support me and that have never supported me through the good and the bad. And it's it's really cool, and uh, I'm I'm so excited and so happy to be where I am at the moment. <laughs> Absolutely, and I must admit, uh, well, I, I don't like admitting this on air, but uh, I even shed a tear on your behalf that day <laughs> that you ended up tumbling down the order. Um, so let's start there. Let's take it the other side of the coin now. Um, that was possibly the lowest low of lows you've ever experienced. Yeah, it's, um, yeah just to set the record straight, I wasn't crying, I had Sandy Myers. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I shared it here. A lot of dust in the air in Southern Africa, apparently, at that time as well. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, no, it was, hey uh, man, we yeah. felt we, we felt for you. We really felt for you. <laughs> it was uh, it was probably like one of the most emotional days I've ever had in my life. Um, you know, it was it was probably the only time in my life that I realized that I could actually you know be a top competitor in Dakar and 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 actually go for a win. That was that was the biggest thing. And um, you know, we had spoken about it. Yeah, Yamaha and myself had had gone through all the the do's and the don'ts and what we could do and what we could achieve and how we could get there and everything like that uh, on the rest day which was the day before I crashed and um, it was incredible you know we actually as a team we knew okay hey, listen we're in there we're in with a shot you know we're in a really good position we're four minutes off the lead and four minutes in rally racing is nothing so yeah. we're all, all, all I think uh, over excited and, and really excited for the position we're in and, and uh, you know but that's really racing. You know, I started on that morning was so positive and, and so ready for the day. And actually actually on the back foot, because I thought, listen, slow down a little bit. You're in a really good position and uh, you don't need to, to waste any time or, or try anything stupid because you're so close to the lead. And uh, let's just take it easy. And, uh, you know, the first 31 Ks was incredible. It was like I started off second. I caught the first guy already. So I knew I was on, on in the front on the road. So it was all about navigating. It's exactly what I wanted to do. It was exactly the position we needed to be in. And um, unfortunately, something small caught me out. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things that's racing. And, and it was a very unlucky crash. It was probably the slowest crashes I've had in a long time. Um, I was only doing about 60 or 70 Ks an hour when I went down. And uh, nothing happened to me. To my body, uh, I was really healthy, but uh, 
the chain the chain guide broke, which uh, in turn pulled the chain off, which wrapped around the front sprocket, which is extremely difficult to get out, you know, especially being by yourself and you have limited tools, obviously. So it took me a while to get it out. And uh, I think that's that's the reason why I'm so emotional is because I literally watched guys go past and I thought, you know, this is it. I've thrown the win away. I've thrown the top three away. I, I knew that I could get on a podium. And unfortunately, yeah, that's, that's how it is. And, and at that point, I realized. But, you know, the, the main thing is I didn't want to give up. You know, I've got the whole of Southern Africa and, and a lot of people around the world cheering for me and that were rooting for me. And, like, I had so many messages and stuff the night before. So I knew I couldn't give up. <laughs> that was the main thing. And never give up, you know. <laughs> You never know what's going to happen the next day or the next kilometer even. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we, we managed to finish the day. But, yeah, a little bit broken, but yeah, really at the finish. Take us to the other side there, please. We, we've heard your side of it now. But uh, obviously being new to a works team, uh, how did the, the team receive this incident of yours? Um, did they think, ah, oh, rookie screwing up or a case of uh, bad luck or, uh, you know, we never see the other side of the coin. How, how did the t team respond to you as a rider? Because obviously you're going to sort of have your tail between your legs going back and say hey, sorry boys, it didn't happen. Mm. Um, what did they say to you? How do they receive that? How, how do they make you feel better about the situation? <laughs> well, the, the first thing I can say is, you know, for me um, sitting on the ground and, and thinking about things and everything going through my head, you know, Yamaha has, has taken a big chance on me. I don't have many um, years of rally experience. I don't have many results. <clears throat> and they, they gave it their all for me, you know. They put in a, a big investment into me. And uh, so sitting on the ground, you know, it wasn't only disappointing myself or my family or my sponsors. It was also disappointing the whole team, you know. And, uh, you know, when, when you go to Dakar, there's five riders and there's 28 team members. So there's a lot of people looking after you and there's a lot of people there just to to help you out and and to to give you what you need you know so so obviously you know that was part of the emotion where i'm sitting there thinking i've let everyone down and uh <clears throat> clearly there was um you know there was a lot of dust and uh even when i got home that night to the team there was a lot of dust there because there was there was not a dry eye in the pits so <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah i think everyone everyone emotionally was was really upset because i think um not for myself but also for the team you know we realized that this is the position that that they've been working on a, on a lot of years and uh you know they've also been so close so many times with adrian van beveren and now you know i've, I've given them the opportunity and, and i've let them down so it was really difficult, but I think I put more pressure on myself and, and I was more angry with myself than I was, than, than the team were with me. You know, they understand that this is racing and this can happen and the, the you know, crashes do happen. Um, it's part of the sport, it's part of what we sign up for. But um, yeah, I think all in all, everyone was, was upset. You know, the whole, of, the whole of Southern Africa was upset and I think everyone back home wanted, wanted an African person on the podium. You know, it's been a long time since Alfie's, Alfie's done that. So... Yeah. So I think all in all, the emotion was high, you know. So it was, it wasn't bad for me, you know. I wasn't in trouble, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a threat to get out of the team because I, because I made a little mistake, you know. I was putting everything I had into it, and I think they realized that and they saw that, and uh, yeah, the team was happy, and yeah, we, we just got to look forward, you know. That does happen, and uh, we just got to make sure that we get to the finish next year. At at the end of the day, that that's the first objective, getting to the finish, and and sadly. The team had a, a bit of a, a problem with the engines this year, um, but that's yeah. also part of a growing phase. Uh, Yamaha, well, it's been dominated by KTM for so many years. Uh, now Yamaha has stepped forward and say we are a serious threat. Um, but that also comes with a bit of fine tuning and development yeah. uh, growing into the future. And I'm sure that everybody's going to be super determined in the new year. Was this something you guys expected? Obviously. You don't go there with the idea to retire, but um, sadly, these things also happen. Yeah, one hundred percent. You know, um, you know, none of our bikes uh, got to the finish line, which is which is a huge yeah. disappointment for any team, not just us. You know, it doesn't matter who you are in motorsport if you don't get to the finish line, it's uh, it's like a failure. So for us, it was it was a huge thing, and uh, I think that uh, you know. Uh, Yamaha, uh, you know, felt terrible about it, uh, rider per rider. You know, we we're all in a good position and we we're all doing what we needed to do. And uh, it 
it's one of those things. And, you know, there's a lot of people that have, have negative negative comments about Yamaha, but at the end of the day, mm-hmm. they, they're a manufacturer mm-hmm. that has put their life on the line to to let us race yeah. and to give us these kind of opportunities. So they've, they've done everything they can. You know, they've worked uh, night and day to get the bikes ready and to get them as fast enough. You know, KTM and Honda have been dominating. And uh, this year, definitely Yamaha was up there, and Yamaha could definitely have taken the win without a doubt. The bike's fast enough; it's it's yeah. it's strong enough, and uh, you know the the suspension is good enough. The handling is excellent, so they definitely on the on the right track, you know. Um, but uh, you know, unfortunately, we had a problem with the engine. I can tell you now that uh, that each each bike had a different malfunction, so it wasn't the same malfunction as as everyone thought in the beginning. So, so you know, it's you can't blame it anymore. It's not a blame game. Um, the bikes are running at 110 percent. You know, we do 160, 170 k's an hour for six hours straight on a day, and we're at kilometer 6,500 when my broke. You know, so. It's it's putting it's putting a bike through everything, you know. It's it's um, you know I can't explain what those things go through. It's it's redlining most of the time throughout the the race and six thousand five hundred k's. Any machine is is bound to fail. So yeah. you know mm-hmm. everyone forgets that Honda have had these problems, KTM have had these problems, and they've had years and years of experience and and years and years of time to to fix them. And uh, you know the year before Ricky Brabick won on a Honda, the bike broke down. So. It's Absolutely. the same as us, you know. We just got to go back to the drawing board. We just got to work on the reliability of the engine, and we just got to, you know, do a little bit more testing. Unfortunately, you know, I joined the team a little bit later than everyone else, so I didn't have much testing on the bike. I didn't have much durability testing and reliability testing on the engines. So yeah, you know, we're not going to sit and say, "Oh yeah, it was the bike or it was it was the engine that gave us a problem." I'm I'm so happy with the bike. I'm so happy with the engine. It's it's incredible, you know, to to last as long as it did, and and we haven't done any work on it, and we haven't done any testing or or, or testing with the reliability is incredible. And uh, yeah, I give my hats off to the team. You know, they did an incredible job, and. Uh, we we're definitely gonna come back fighting next year. That's for sure. You know they they determined and uh, we determined. So I'm so excited. You know we've already started working on things. So yeah, I think uh, you know the negative negativity has got to stop with uh, with the negative yeah. for sure. And uh, we just gotta we gotta look on the positive side. And uh, yeah. yeah, you know we got so much support and we got so many good things going for us. That we don't have to look at the negative side. We just gotta look at the positive side. Have fun and uh, go show them next year what we can do. Yeah. So, Ross, if, if I can ask you, besides the bike, right, and, and it takes such a lot of um, preparation on the mechanical side of, of, of the bike and, and financially, right, but how do you mentally and physically prepare for the back off? <laughs> Clint, that's, uh, that's such an awesome question, you know, because uh, a, a lot of people don't understand what we have to go through <laughs> yeah. when we when we do the race. You know, it's eight and a half, nine thousand kilometers, and... Uh, you know, mentally, mentally is way more difficult than, than being physically strong because you you like awake most of the the fourteen days that yeah. you're racing. You know, you don't get much sleep and and it's really hard to get in routine and you have to actually be so mentally strong that you block everything out. You block the negativity out. You block a, you have to yeah. even block some of your friends out. You know, you've just got to focus on on the job at hand. And uh, you know, I go there. You. The, the whole month before the race, I, I just go into a place where it's just me and my wife and a couple of friends yeah. up in the Okavango Delta. And all I do is just put my mind down and say, listen, we've got to do this. I want to do this. And that's the main thing. You obviously got to want it just yeah. as much as, as you need to do it. And, um, you know, and then we start the sleep training where you sleep for maybe four hours, five hours a day. And, and then you get back and get ready to go. You know, a lot of people miss out at home because you've got such a short yeah. um you know, TV show on it. We st- just just to put it out there. We start at three o'clock in the morning. We start riding riding our bike. You know, it's dark. The lights aren't the best. Yeah. <laughs> You're riding on roads that you don't know. It's freezing cold. Sometimes it's up to minus three, minus four in the morning, and uh, you ride 600 k's before you even get to the start line of a race. And uh, then you get to the start line, you've got maybe 20 minutes to get ready, and then you go and race 400, 500 k's, and uh, then you've got another 200, 300 k's afterwards. So it's it's a good thousand k's in the day, and um, you know it's it's really mentally tiring where you just want to fall asleep on the bike, you know. So it's uh, it's really important. I take the whole month before Dakar to to get ready, and obviously physically during the year we ride a lot and we train a lot. So so physically I, I'm there, but mentally is definitely the hardest part of the rally. Yeah, so 
so, so there's, there's another thing. I, I, I've got people sending me messages to say I need to block them before I go racing. <laughs> 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 so what I want to ask is, take us through the, through the navigation of this year because it was extremely uh, interesting. Let me rather put it that way because you know I, I followed the Dakar before it starts. I'm on some of the um, some of the the WhatsApp groups of the of the teams and that, so I get some insight. Um, and and I know there was a not negativity, but there was a lot of discussion about the bikes going first and the cars coming and and getting lost at night. <laughs> oh, just just talk us through that because I, I was so I was so intrigued with it, being on on a bike and not even on a car. Yeah, it's um it's crazy. Um, you know, you don't realize how hard the navigation is until you're actually doing it. And uh, you know, on a bike, you you're obviously by yourself. You've got to ride at 160, 170 k's an hour if you want to be competitive. And then you've also got to try and read the road book. And uh, not many people realize that you've actually got a little button by your thumb. That you you scroll the road book so you get a road book 20 yeah. minutes before the start of each race and all it is basically is a little map with arrows and a heading so it'll say okay at kilometer 10 by this little tree you're going to turn left onto cap heading of 240 <laughs> and you're going to carry yeah. on for 500 meters so you know all it's 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 not too hard when you're going like really slowly and you 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 like basically walking pace you can follow it and, and it makes sense but when you start going fast you start missing notes and you start getting into the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden you've got no tracks in front of you you've got no tracks behind you you can't see any dust and uh yeah if you think if you think it's bad getting lost with your wife in the in the passenger seat <laughs> shouting at you try get lost on your motorbike by yourself <laughs> <laughs> it's probably one of the scariest things I've ever had to do. You know, I'm a pilot and I've been lost a couple of times yeah. in the air trying to find airfields and stuff, but getting lost on your bike in the middle of the air that you don't know where you are, <laughs> it's a completely different thing. Um, but this year, you know, they made the navigation really, really tough um, to try and slow yeah. the race down a little bit because the speeds are, are absolutely insane. Um, so, yeah. so they made the navigation really hard. So. I think uh, I made a, a little bit of a mistake, but obviously it's just because of experience and stuff is is that some stages I should have finished a little bit lower, like 12th, uh, 13th, 14th, somewhere around there instead of finishing maybe 6th or 7th. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, when you finish 6th or 7th, uh, the, the leaders also slow down a lot to open the road. They call it opening the road when you've got no tracks in yeah. front of you and you've got to do all the navigation. And uh, as soon as you catch up to the front bunch of people, it's really difficult to try and pass somebody and, and to try and open the road because yeah. the speed that you're opening the road at and the speed that you're trying to read the road book, uh, they don't coincide, you know. So you've got to yeah. you've got to be really careful. And it's, it's a real yeah. strategy game at the end of the day with the, with the navigation. You've got to make sure that you're in the right position on each day. You know, you don't want to be uh, up in the front. And uh, the, the funny enough, you know, I went there thinking – shit, I want to win as many stages as I can because that's yeah. the best. You know, you always want to win. As a competitor, you want to win. And uh, Yamaha turned around and said, listen, you don't want to win one stage. We don't want you to win yeah. one stage. We want you to finish outside the top five and we're yeah. happy inside the top 10. You're good. Yeah. But, you know, when you do 500 Ks through the bush, <laughs> uh, it's not like you just got a cell phone to get a message to say, hey, listen, buddy, slow down a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, I've got to ask this question. You, you are a pilot by profession. Um, your experience as a pilot uh, in navigating, obviously, uh, reading terrain. Um, but coming from South Africa, how does that compare to what you experienced in the desert? Now, um, it, it's quite an adaptation. And as you just said, at 170 k's an hour, <laughs> things don't look quite the same. Uh, and and I, I hate. The, 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 just the idea of having to look down on a map and look up just in time to see this massive yeah. rock in front of me is not yeah. something that I fancy. Uh, and I'm sure you've had a few uh, moments along the way as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, put it this way. I, I took uh, 28 sets of underwear just in case I needed to change it. <laughs> 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 but uh, no, it's just it's, uh, it's it is <laughs> you have uh, you have a lot of a lot of moments you know it's uh it's yeah. one of those things um you know you try to ride like 80, in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> uh, we try so, so, like 85 percent it's it's really really difficult because obviously as a racer you want to go as fast as you possibly can especially if you're behind somebody and you see their dust you want to catch up to them but you do have so many moments you know and uh a lot of luck you know i'm a full believer in you make your own luck but there is a lot of luck involved that uh you've got to you've got to you know plan and be strategic and where you can where you think it's safe enough to go fast you've got to go fast as you can and and yeah. where it's not safe you go slow down and it's a very fine line you know that's why you have the crashes and you have the mistakes from from everybody yeah. you know the top riders this year in the second week the top five guys crashed out and it just shows yeah. that that uh, it doesn't matter how good you are or how fast you are, you know, you got to watch out for those kind of things. So, yeah, we had a lot of moments, uh, definitely this year, the first week, because everybody was pushing so fast, you know, I, I wanted to be in the top and I needed to be in the top. And I pretty much knew that that my ride counted on it because, you know, my contract ended on the 31st of January this year after Dakar. Yeah. So I knew I needed to do something and I knew I needed to to be there. And not just because I wanted to carry on and, and get another ride for next year, but just because I wanted to and I, would, I, I fully think that i needed to be there and i could be there so so we had to put a lot on the line and i, I took a lot of risks 100 percent. you know i thought uh you know the little crash that i had uh, on day seven you know it was it was coming and i thought it would happen a lot sooner than it did so for sure we we do put a lot on the line so talking about that and you, and you touch about on changing underwear <laughs> i can't remember who, who was the rider but Talk us through the different uh, tire compound and the change of conditions because there was one rider that used the uh, traditional uh, cable ties to, to tie his back tire. I don't know if you saw that, Patrick. And he yes, made it to the end. He made it to the end at speed. Not 85% or 90 at speed. Yeah. You know, there's there's one legend in rally racing and, uh, you know, somebody that I look up to and I, I think I will forever, never, if, even if I had to eventually one day beat him. You know, Toby Price is, is an incredible guy. Yeah. He's an incredible sportsman. Um, you know, and I spoke to him that day. He said, listen, Ross, this is all I can do. I've got cable ties, I've got duct tape. He duct taped it up, put cable ties on. He said, hey, listen, let's go get some food and let's see what happens tomorrow. I don't think I'll make 50Ks, but I'm going to give him all. And, uh, you know, he finished third on that stage. And I went up to him. I said, yeah. tell you what happened. And he says, I don't know what happened. He said, there must have been Australian cable ties because they're really strong. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, it was so cool to see. Uh, and it's really good, you know. And I, I like, I love the guy. He's, he's an amazing athlete and uh, he's a really good friend. And uh, yeah, just to see that, you know, it, sh it just shows that, uh, anything's possible, you know. He went yeah. in there thinking, okay, I've got 50 Ks, but meanwhile, he comes out third in yeah. the stage in the in a Dakar rally, which is incredible. You know, it's it's some people's dream. It's my dream, you know, to finish third on a stage, and yeah. and all of a sudden he's doing it with uh, 16 cable ties and all of duct tape holding his tire together. <laughs> you guys were restricted in, in in tire usage. In other words, the amount of tires <laughs> available to you. Um, did you find that a real problem? <laughs> Obviously, well, Toby Price was a a case in point there to a degree, <laughs> but um, uh, isn't it a little bit on the risky side to limit you guys on tires? Uh, I would say, yes, it, I could apply to the cars, but on the bikes, if you're running out of tire, uh, I think the safer option would be to just give you another tire. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a sore point. I, I definitely do not agree with the, with the rule. I don't think it helps in any way to slow it down. Um, the the organisation's idea was if we had limited tires, we'd would start conserving them and slow down a little bit. And uh, this mm, year, not the first, racing, the first not six racing. days, <laughs> nah, the first six days, the fastest I've ever been on a motorbike in my life. <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely not conserving tires. <laughs> that light goes green, the the horns yeah, come out. That's, and it's it. <laughs> that's it. You know, I've always been taught looking in front of you, so no way I'm looking at the back tire. <laughs> <laughs> did you have personally have problems with tires on this event um yeah we had we had small issues you know the biggest problem is is that uh everybody pretty much chose ch chose the same tire it wasn't only a tire rule where you allowed uh, six tires throughout the race it was also uh the compound and the design of the tire you're only allowed one choice out of three choices you're only allowed to take that one and whatever you choose on day one you have to stick with through the whole rally um you know the <laughs> You know, the profile of the tire was was a little bit thinner than the rest, but it was definitely the one that lost the longest. 
So we went with that tire, and uh, you know it, it gets slippery. Um, you know, going over dunes when you when you're going the speeds that the top guys are going, and uh, all of a sudden you've got no traction left on the back tire. You don't slow down as hot, as as quick as you need to, and uh, that was a little bit dangerous. I wasn't too comfortable with that because you end up jumping off, you know, three story, four story high dunes and and onto the flat. So uh, I personally think that a lot of other riders I think will will stand up for it. Is is that it was more dangerous, um, just because you know we. We're gonna go for it. <laughs> you're not gonna. Absolutely. You're not gonna slow anyone down yeah. because if you slow yeah. down, the guy behind you is not gonna slow down. So, oh, right. so there's no, there's no choice. You know. You're not going for a gap so. in this case, but if there's a nice open road ahead of you, you're going for it. And just, no, no racing driver exactly. will ever hold back. It's, it's. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it depends. And, and this is actually a point I want to ask you. So the first time when you did that car. Did you do it as as a as a private tier of uh, personally finance? Because now obviously you're in the in the Yamaha team. How how different is it? Because exactly to the point that Patrick just mentioned, I, I think when you're private tier, you tend to slow down. You tend to think about tomorrow. Um, you tend to think about the checkbook. <laughs> so um, <laughs> how different is is racing with with a factory team versus being a private tier? Yeah, there's there's so many differences, you know. I was I was extremely fortunate, you know. KTM South Africa helped me a lot um, to to get to the first two Dakars without a doubt. They they supported me in a big way. But we still went as a privateer. We still had to raise over 1.3, 1.4 million rand per year. Um, so it was really difficult, you know. I was I was having sleepless nights leading up to the Dakar to think, okay, have we paid this? Have we paid that? And, yeah. uh, you know, even when you're at the Dakar, you still get charged for the spare that you use. So you, you do want to slow exactly. down a bit in case you crash. And, yeah. you know, just the tower, the roadbook tower is 100,000 Rand. Um, so you don't want to crash and break that off, you know, because I was, I was extremely lucky and uh, I had so much support from back home and, and Southern Africa helped me out so much get to, to Dakar. You know, we did fundraisers every weekend and everybody chipped in and yeah. there's so many people to thank for that you know that that made it possible for me to go over but um yeah that was it was extremely difficult and stressful you know not only for me but for my wife as well yeah. we we both had to you know give up everything that we've got sell everything that we have and dig into our savings <laughs> to try and get there yeah. so it was it was incredible you know but um it still shows the support structure that we have in South Africa to to get yeah. athletes and to get motorsport athletes over to these big races, and uh, it's incredible to see the support we do have. You know, it's uh, it's so good to see that people still believe in us as, as racers and that we can go and make something out of it. And uh, then, you know, to, you know, changing over to a factory was first of all a dream come true for me because I've I've never seen so many spare parts and and things available <laughs> to me in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, and, 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 and there's no thing <laughs> you don't have to think yeah. about it. You can just ask. Yeah, the place the the yeah, that's it. That's you know, you just say, hey, "Listen, I want to try this," and it's on the bike. You know, as a blink of an eye. So, <laughs> so it was incredible. And then you know, it's the first time I've ever slept on the flight over to Dakar because I don't have to worry about. Listen, we've got to try and plan not to crash, and we've got to do this because I knew that I wanted to go over and give my best results and. Uh, I could fully commit on the start line to go as fast as I possibly could. And, uh, you know, whether the outcome is a crash or whether the outcome is winning the stage, I think that was the biggest thing for me mentally wise, as you said in the beginning of the show, is, is such a mental game that I could literally go out there and just give it everything I've had. They, they you know, um, as the MR team said to me when I first arrived there, I was, I was really scared to ask for things. I was really scared to test things. And I just wanted a bike to ride. That was all, you know, I just wanted to get on and go and have fun. And uh, they said to me, they said, listen, Ross, we're in the toolbox. And uh, whatever need, whatever tool you need in the toolbox, yeah. you open the drawer and you take the tool out, whether it's with the team manager, the team assistant, the mechanics, sure. uh, you know, anybody. You just, you just use and abuse us as much as you want, whatever you need from us we're going to give you so it was it was a, a completely different style of racing for yeah. me and uh, it took a yeah. long time luckily enough i was able to race in spain to get used to it because it's it's a different world you know and it's uh, like yeah. i say it's it's a lot of pressure but uh, really good pressure and it's a pressure that i think i need to to do well because they want to win just as badly as i do and uh, for me that was the main thing we, we both had the same goal um you know we didn't have to worry about the checkbook if we crashed and stuff like this so yeah. 
So for me, I could push as hard as I, I could. So I think that's why I made such a big step. Everyone was asking, like, yeah. but listen, you haven't you haven't changed much in speed over the last year. So how do you go from finishing tenth to fifteenth to you know finishing second and thirds on the stage? Exactly. And I was just like, well, <laughs> I don't have to close my eyes for the best anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes yeah. a big difference. I must say, I, I truly admire them, the what they call the Malamoto or the what's the Moto Originals now. Um, you just have to say hats off to those guys and, and girls. Um, it's it's an incredible feat just to reach the finish of the of the car mm. going solo in that way. And I'm sure from your mm. from your own experience, you 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 can actually give us a, a perspective from your side as to just what it takes for a person to do what they're doing. We've had the privilege to speak to Kuba Sportgitter and uh, David Thomas and those guys over the years. And even, um, uh, yeah, I, I just cannot fathom um, just how much that must take out of you. Because you are totally buggered after a day and you're still, you've got, you don't get to do that 14 days on the trot. Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy. I have the utmost respect for those guys. You know, I was lucky enough uh, this year to have a friend of mine, um, James Alexander from Mount, and I think yes. he did it. You know, the the leader did it in 44 hours, the whole Dakar, and I think his total time was 126. So you know, he did two and a half Dakars in the time that we've all done one Dakar, and he did it all by himself. You know, I went up to him some nights. He was arriving at one o'clock in the morning. He had to be awake by three o'clock in the morning, and he still had to service his bike. Um, and you know, I take my hats off to them. That's the original, the original class by Motel, and uh, it's incredible what they do and what they put themselves yeah. through. You know, I, I was lucky enough to follow James and, and to be a big part of his journey to Dakar and after Dakar. You know, we still speak to each other every second day, and he's still recovering from Dakar. And I can fully understand. You know, I know what I put my body through, and I'm lucky enough to have a complete support system behind me where there's guys that are looking after the bike. There's, there's guys that are looking after my nutrition and my dinner and my food and everything. Sure. And he's got to do all that himself. And, uh, you know, I think I would be brave enough to do that. Uh, I think that they're in a different level. They, they definitely guys that and girls, guys and girls that want to go out there and, you know, test their bodies and their bike to the limit. And they do that 100%. It's, it's really incredible what they go through, you know, and uh, we're going to have a couple of Southern African guys going again, 2022. And I think it's going to be awesome. You know, I think we need all the support we can to give them because, you know, at the end of the day for myself as well, you know, we sit in wherever we sit in, if we're sitting in a Malamoto tent or we're sitting in a camper, we're sitting at the, at the food hall. Uh, the only thing that keeps us going, especially after like day four, day five, where things get a bit tough is, is the messages of support and you know the everybody being so excited about our adventure and our journey and everybody giving us a ahead and being like hey listen you've got this and don't give up and you know especially me you know after my crash i went and i sat on my phone for two hours because the messages of support and the message of you know the the positivity yeah. coming off my phone was incredible like listen ross don't give up now you've had a crash don't worry we're not going to go for the win but you're still going to get top 10 and it was it was really like uplifting and boosting so to yeah. to everybody that supports all of us you know not just myself but whether it's myself or the guys in the Malamoto or the guys in the cars um it really really means a lot to us although we don't get to reply as much as we'd like to because it's a bit hectic but um yeah but the support to us keeps us going to tell you the truth and especially when you you're in Saudi Arabia it's a foreign country and it's it's really difficult and and different to what we used to and uh, you get you know some of the homeboys saying hey listen guys you got this uh, you're going to be home in this time you're going to come back to you know to a lot of people sitting at the airport welcoming you home and uh you know you can tell your story a million times over and it, it's it's incredible it's probably one of the best feelings about that is the support that we get from from us at home yeah Another aspect that I would like to touch on, you know, I know you, when you go out there on the day, you've got one objective, and that's to beat everybody around you. But the, the, the camaraderie between riders and drivers on Dakar is, is something that you cannot help but notice. Um, truly, you depend on each other as well, because if you should fall and something happens to you, the next guy on the scene is possibly going to be the guy that saves your life or whatever the case might be. Yet, uh, when the two of you are going shoulder to shoulder, you're quite happy to put him in the bush to try and beat him. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite an interesting concept because on, on the one side, you're willing to ride over him to beat him. 
but you're also the guy who's going to depend on when something goes wrong. And, and, and that is actually a beautiful aspect of this event. That's, I think that's the best aspect of this event. You know, um, you get there to Sweetenarian and everybody's friendly and everybody's asking questions about where you're from. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're the winner or if you're the, you're last place, everybody gets on and everybody has a good chat to each other. And you, you're 100% correct. You know, you start off the start line and you'll look at each other saying, I'm going to beat you today. But you'll race each other as hard as you can. But you can you can definitely know that when you get to the that finish line, that, that whoever you beat or whoever beat you, there's going to be a handshake to say, well done, and a fist pump and say, this is it, this is really good. Because you do know that if you have a big crash, is that your biggest competitor and the, the guy that you that you want to beat the most, he could be the guy picking you up and saving your life. You are 100% uh, correct. You know, it's a, it's a huge thing for us. And, uh, you know, when you look at each other on the start line, you think, yes, like, okay, cool. I want to beat this guy. I want to beat that guy and, and this and that. But you also know, okay, listen, uh, if I have a big crash, I want that guy to pick me up. I don't want him to just ride past me and just leave me in the bush. You know, it's uh, 400 Ks of of absolutely nothing, uh, 400, 500 yeah. Ks where you don't see anybody for, for hundreds of Ks. So, so you know that the only person that's going to help you, that's going to save you, that's going to, you know, comfort you when you are in a different world because you your head is going to be that guy that you're racing your heart out against. So, um, you know, between everybody, between the cars, the trucks, the bikes, the side-by-sides, everybody gets on. And, uh, you know, that's what's really cool about the marathon stage is that there's no pit involved. There's no there's no pit yeah. crew there. There's no people. It's just the competitors. So you meet almost every single person that's entered the Dakar, and you get to have a chat to most of them. And it's, uh, it's really cool. Everybody sits down, eats dinner together, tells the stories of past Dakars. And, um, you know, like for me, uh, I'll – you, my hero is Stefan Peter Hassel, and uh, I've always looked up to the guy. And the first Dakar I went to, I was so shy, I couldn't even speak to him. And uh, you know, now I can go and say, Hey, listen, well done, that's a hey, great, great job, man. That's awesome, and it's it's an incredible feeling, you know, it's a, it's yeah. a feeling of of real sportsmanship. And uh, I think that's what I love about Dakar as well is that everybody's sportsman there, yeah. yeah. So, we uh, sorry, Patrick, we, we have okay. some comments, we have comments here from the audience. Um, so it's uh, we, we always get reminded that we are on um, social media and we need to, <laughs> we need to put the, we need to, we need the audience to participate. So I'm urging the audience to ask some questions here. Uh, we have a we have a question we have a question here where they're asking if you got paid to to drive your bike on on, on I'm assuming it's on the current deck or the, the deck yeah. this year. Yeah, you know, Sunny with the factory is obviously a salary ride. Uh, so they give you a salary for the whole year and um, it depends on what races some salaries are different to to other guys you know obviously coming in as a, as a newbie um, you know I was one of the lower salaries but uh, then I only get to race three or four races until you prove yourself and then you get to do the the rest of the world championship so hopefully uh, COVID dependent that this year I can do the, the complete world championship but yes it is a is a salary ride and uh, you know it's it's not the biggest salary but you can definitely, you know, get by. And then obviously where, where the money plays a big part in car is winning bonuses. You know, the top five guys are getting getting good money and uh, that's where you're money in, in Dakar and rally racing. Ross, the, what you've just mentioned is very interesting now, but the, uh, you just mentioned that you could be doing the world championship. So basically if COVID didn't play a role, you would have done the world championship in 2020. Now, for 2021, if that opportunity comes along, um, that opens a, another completely new spectrum because Dakar in itself is a world championship. I think everybody considers that the ultimate. <laughs> you don't have to win anything else. You can just win the Dakar and you've achieved everything you want to. But if you could add a world championship, so much the better. Yeah, for sure. You know, that was that was our, our main plan to start with. You know, I knew Dakar was going to be extremely tough to win. And uh, especially coming out on your third or fourth year, you know, there's very few guys. It's only Toby and uh, most likely Daniel Saunders and stuff that can win it in the first uh, three or four years. So I knew it was going to be really tough. So so my plan was to do as well as I possibly could in the World Championship. And uh, while racing those races, obviously gain experience for Dakar. But uh, that was the plan to try and go for a World Championship. You know, it's a... Uh, it's something that no one can ever take away from you as being a world champion of, of your facets of the sport. And uh, I still plan on on giving it my best go in 2021, COVID pendant. Um, I'm really hoping that that we can do the rounds. And and uh, luckily enough for me, I proved myself at Dakar. So Yamaha has agreed to to put me into all those world championship rounds. 
Um, cool. So I've got a good shot at it. No, I've got uh, exciting 2021 and even a better 2022 where, where we go to Dakar and obviously with a bit more experience and I've learned from my mistakes in, in this year's one for sure. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for 2021. Definitely. I, I want to ask two, two elements that still bug me about Dakar that you can put a new perspective on. Um, I've got a little bit of rallying experience, but the bottom line is it, it, those enormous dunes, the blind side <laughs> of the dune. You guys on the bikes go over there, take a tumble, and the next moment, one of these massive fire trucks come over the top. Uh, <laughs> I cannot imagine a scarier sight than that as a biker. Uh, and it happens on the car. It's, it's a reality. Yeah. yeah. Without a doubt, you know, I think that's my biggest fear. I'm not, I'm not scared of crashing 960 k's an hour, but I'm scared of crashing at 2 k's an hour. 960 <laughs> behind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, uh, yeah, those, those are not small, and uh, they do know they, they faster than us bikes. Uh, even the cars, you know, the cars are really quick, and uh, you know, they also in their own race, so they don't care if we line on the other side of the dune. They go as fast as they possibly can. So, uh, the ideal situation. Don't crash on the other side of it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, be, the next best idea is if you do crash, run away. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, do have, you do have these sirens warn you. The cars warn you when they approach you from behind. Um, but it must be an intimidating feeling sitting on a bike, going as quickly as you possibly can. And you've got this hooligan coming past you on the left-hand side and, and an even bigger truck on the right-hand side. Um, how often do you find you, yourself in those situations on, on an event like this? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, you know, it's happened to me twice in the three years that I've done it. Luckily, only twice. Um, <laughs> but you do, if you, if you have a bad stage, um, you know, NASA Alatea was only 20 minutes off the last... Uh, Oh, this Dakar was only 20 minutes off the bike, so they're going extremely quick as well. So you have one small little problem, you're definitely going to get caught by them. And, uh, you know, when they do catch you, it's not so much uh, the car drivers are really good. They they try and, like, give you enough space. But when they pass you, it makes a dust cloud where you can't see your hand in front of your face. So you've got to slow down. And as soon as you slow down, the next car is catching you, you know. So so once you get caught by one car, one truck, that's it for the rest of the night you or the day. You know, you're in the, you're in the dust. You... You're going to you're going to be in the dust, uh, getting caught one by one by the cars, and, and it's really difficult and really dangerous to to ride in that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, ideally the the top twenty bikes, I don't think get caught by anybody um, on a normal day. And uh, you know, I try and keep myself that way, <laughs> so, mainly because I'm scared of the cars and the tracks. <laughs> great motivation but, uh, to win the event, rather. Yeah, it's exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with NASA being so fast in the cars, it catches you quite quick. So yeah, it's a good way to go to the front and say front. <laughs> You're going international, but uh, from a South African perspective, will the South Africans and the Botswana guys will they be able to see you in action somewhere this year, or will you be at least showing a face somewhere? Um, unfortunately, uh, being international, I suppose social media has made a big difference. It's brought the world closer to us. Um, mm. In the past, you would have a difficult time getting information if you guys overseas doing well, even if you do well. We hardly hear about it in South Africa. And now the, the, the whole world's changed, but there's nothing like that personal contact, seeing you in action. Um, so would there be an opportunity for South Africans to see you somewhere in action this year? Yeah, definitely. You know, um, I think I'm all about that is is I fully believe that that I owe to, to motorsport what, what it's given me. Um, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, racing in South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, you know, all over the place, Namibia. Um, if it wasn't for that, I would never have been even to go been able to go to Dakar. So I would love to give back as much as I possibly could, you know, and I'd love to just go to a race um and and just participate and just be a number you know because i feel i feel that um that motorsport has done that for me and and motorsport has given me um, this opportunity and and this dream that i've lived um so i definitely want to give back as much as i possibly can at the moment it's a little bit difficult to travel you know i try to get across to to south africa actually today to the motocross national tomorrow and uh COVID tests were, were a bit of an issue and a bit of a problem. So at the moment, it's a little bit difficult to travel from Botswana to anywhere in the world. 
Um, but, you know, it's, it's picking up and it's getting better. So definitely, um, you know, if there's any race that I can get to where it's not uh, conflicting with, uh, with the international rally or a rally of any sort, then I'd definitely like to be there. Uh, Kalahari Rally is an extremely awesome rally to be a part of, so I'd like yeah. to, to do that. And, uh, you know, the Tanqua Rally up in the, the Western Cape is, is incredible and a great training ground for us. So I'm going to try my best to be there as well. Um, just COVID dependent, but uh, yeah, for sure. You know, I'd love to be at a couple of the national events and even the regional events just to go and participate and you know, share my story. Uh, there's a lot of people that participate that have believed in me and that have, that have helped me through what has been a, an incredible, you know, challenge to get to Dakar. And uh, I feel that I owe it and to all the people that support me to go and do a race where people can come and ask me questions about Dakar and, and interact about what's going on and how it is. And, you know, there's so many behind the scenes stories that I've got to share. And uh, I love it. You know, it's part of the it's a part of the story. It's a part of my journey. And uh, I'm really grateful to to everybody that got me there. So I would love to participate in as many as I can. And I'm hoping to head down to PE in the next couple of weeks to go and do a talk there. And uh, yeah, I, will, I love it. You know? So racing's in my blood. I, I don't do it just because it's a job. I do it because I love doing it. So anyone that I can get to, then you can come in. <laughs> well, that's great to hear. Uh, and of course, something that we can chat about all night is, is the youngsters in the sport. Um, it's tough times out there. Um, you don't always want to say you need a bank full of money before you can do anything in motorsport, but it is expensive. But I think more than anything else, um, you need that passion, the drive, the will to to get into motorsport. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, coming from a middle-class family where, where my dad, uh, you know, worked overtime and he, he did – extra job to to keep me racing and to keep me going and uh he put he put his whole life on hold just to to help me follow my dreams uh, he gave me everything that he had and more and uh he you know he had finished work on a on a friday at lunchtime and he drove me to cape town to do a race on saturday and saturday night after the race we'd drive back and get home sunday night to so work on monday morning so Definitely, it's not a. It is an expensive sport without a doubt, and it's expensive to get into. But if there's if there's a passion and uh, you know if there's a dream, I, I fully believe that uh, I wasn't very good at school. I'm still not good at school, <laughs> but um, you know it was, it was a dream of mine to to go and represent my country and to to do what I can overseas and and do what I do what I know best, and that's to ride a motorbike. So it was a dream of mine to go over and do that, and. Uh, Although, yeah, you know, there was a lot of things in the way that that stopped us going, you know, straight to America or straight to Europe or, or you know, to any of the big places that have that have motorsports. Um, I never gave up, and uh, my dad didn't either. My mom and dad gave me everything, and uh, they never gave up either. And uh, you know, it's it's been thirty years of racing now, and uh, you know, it's only started to come together now. This is my first factory ride, and and now we're starting to see the benefits of all the hard work and and the dreams, you know, and uh, definitely if the, for the youngsters, never give up on a dream. And if you, if you want it bad enough, you can definitely get it without a doubt. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that say, ah, oh, you know, you're dreaming, you can't get there. And uh, I had a principal that said, I'll never do, I'll never be able to race and make a living. Um, and, you know, as soon as I got my first paid ride, when I went to Europe and I was 15 years old, I went back to him and I said, hey, listen, it's not much and it's not probably as much as yours, but I've got a paycheck. So, <laughs> Well, it's something that I would love to touch on somewhere in the future. If we do have the opportunity, I would love to see your mom and dad come onto the show and, and we can hear their perspective on it because I truly believe what you just said and, and it's great to hear you honor them like that because uh, it's possibly a dream that your dad had and it couldn't it didn't work out for him but you are living that dream now on his behalf and i, I they must be incredibly proud yeah i'd like to i'd like to think so you know i hope i i have made them proud there's definitely been a lot of times in my life where i've disappointed them <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, <laughs> I definitely I've given it's it my life. all. And, uh, <laughs> they've uh, they've given it their all for for us. So yeah, I'm incredibly thankful, and uh, I know that uh, you know I'll forever be indebted to my dad. For sure. You know, I've seen what he's been through, and some of the times, you know, mm. I haven't put put as much in as I I think that he deserved. 
um, because, you know, I got a little bit lazy at some time of my career and, and he was putting everything into it. And, uh, you know, like I say, we're a team, uh, my whole family team and uh, um, we've never given up. And I think that's, uh, it's all of us, you know, it's been a dream. You know, I think uh, I've seen my dad cry twice in his life and one was at the finish of Dakar. So that was pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah you know um i am incredibly thankful and i'll never forget uh that's one thing so, you know, what happens in my racing career i know over to to my family and uh to the people that have believed in me there's so many people that that believed in me when i was a youngster and uh you know we went through some bad times some bad years i wasn't getting any results i was crashing i was injured and uh they never gave up they believed in me 100 percent and still to this day they're still supporting me still helping me and uh that's incredible about motorsports. I think it brings a lot of people together. And uh, a lot of people say that it's an individual sport, but there's no ways I can say that motorsports individual because there's a team, first of all, your your close team, which is maybe 20 or 30 people that have supported you throughout the journey. And then you get your big team where there's, there's countries and countries of people that have supported you and that believe in you. And, uh, you know, it doesn't always have to be monetary value, but they just the words of wisdom and the words of support Mean, mean more than anything so yeah there's there's a really big team behind me at the moment and I, i'm truly grateful and thankful there's no i in team <laughs> but the take us take us to an international country where uh the color ferrari ferrari is a, a total unknown <laughs> like it was now um did you quickly build up some local support um how do they communicate with you it's a different language it's a different culture it's a different world yet somehow i'm sure people picked up who the Kalari ferrari was and i'm sure <laughs> they gave you a lot of support on, on the way as well yeah it's a it's a really good question and i've got some really incredible stories you know i went over to saudi arabia for the first time obviously nobody knew of who the Kalari ferrari was including myself you know i didn't really know where i was <laughs> but uh, um you know it was it was incredible to see after the first year and with the rookie uh, category that that people started recognizing you know and uh then the second year I went back and it was the funniest thing, you know, uh, some guy that couldn't speak English went on to Google and he found a video of a Kalahari Ferrari. And uh, if you go into Google now, it's, it's quite, quite popular. And uh, it had us in hysterics. We, we had a laugh for half an hour, but we couldn't even communicate to each other. You know, this guy was showing me this video. I was laughing and crying. He was laughing and crying. And we had this full on conversation where none of us understood each other at all, but we understood the whole video. <laughs> <laughs> so it was incredible, you know, and now I, I've got people there that, that come up and call me Kalahari Ferrari. They probably don't even know my real name, but they call me Kalahari Ferrari, which is, <laughs> which is, it's a dream come true. You know, it's uh, what I've aimed for, what I've worked for. And uh, we've got some really cool stickers coming out soon. So <laughs> we can definitely post well, those everywhere. <laughs> that, that's going to be my next question. There's youngsters out there who would yeah. love to associate themselves with a Kalahari Ferrari social media how do they make how do they follow you how do they make contact with you have you got a a fan club as such have you got uh, <laughs> can they get access to t-shirts or something um, it's called a handle patrick it's a handle yeah, those, those are the questions <laughs> really ask us. So, so tell us your, what's your handle <laughs> yeah you know um you, you know guys can always get all the Instagram, I'm, I'm definitely on yeah. Instagram a lot more than I'm on Facebook, uh, and it's Ross Branch BW. So yeah, get hold of me. We got some stickers coming out. We got some shirts coming out. We got some buffs coming out. So we got a whole lot of things lined up, and uh, you know, it's it's not a money making thing for sure. It's just a support system. So definitely, if there's people interested in the product and there's the, uh, people interested in the the really cool logo that uh, that Jason did for us, then. Definitely, you know, get hold of us and, and we can send some stickers your way for sure. And uh, we're going to have some shirts and buffs soon. So, yeah, Ross Branch BW is the one to go for. And if you want to get hold of me on Facebook, is uh, Rossi Branch. So get yeah. hold of me. Please uh, feel free for a chat. And if you guys want to know any more information about Dakar, then, then I'm always available. I don't reply the quickest, but I'll definitely get there. <laughs> I, 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 I actually have an important question, I think. Have you met Valentino Rossi, seeing that you were with Emma? Because I was thinking, Kalahari Ferrari was a doctor. You know, just imagine that on a phone screen. Yeah, you know, uh, we got some really ex exciting stuff coming up within the next uh, couple of months. So I'm going to leave that one there. 
and okay. uh, <laughs> we will see you soon. But uh, I haven't met him more, yet. Right? <laughs> uh, when, 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 when Ross ends up at, at the next Dakar with uh, number 46 on it, then we know they become close buddies. <laughs> <laughs> Ross, obviously you're gonna you're gonna be doing some funny things now. Being a works driver, they're going to get you involved with all kinds of PR and that type of thing. Um, does that take up a lot of your time? Well, I say that with all respect, you you're relatively new to this aspect now, but uh, I'm sure uh, that's also a very important part. You just mentioned you, you yourself enjoy communicating with the supporters. It, it's incredibly important to to keep the people motivated. And and obviously, you represent Yamaha. You represent a manufacturer. And it just has to be like that. Um, if you're a Rossi supporter, you will ride the bike he rides. Um, if you're a Ross supporter, you're going to ride what Ross rides. Um, and, 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 but it, to me, that's something that's gone wrong in motorsport local, especially in South Africa. We used to have those heroes. And it went cold. It became a corporate world. It became more the, the machine became more important than, than the person on it or in it. And and that to me is a, is a terribly big mistake because people want to be associated with the heroes and villains of motorsport. There has to be the good guy. There has to be the guy you don't like. Um, it doesn't make him a bad guy. It's just that you don't you don't support him. Um, yeah. But it's a very important element as far as I'm concerned. You have to have the heroes and the villains. Um, so who do you see as the current heroes and villains in the sport? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I 100% agree with you. You know, I think, uh, you know, the, all the manufacturers nowadays are so close together. They, they all as good as each other. They're really, really good bikes. They're really good cars and uh, they're really good machines. But uh, yeah, I think, I think, you know, that kind of competition is healthy competition where you've got the guys that you do like mm -hmm. and the guys that you don't like. And I think America leads, leads by example in that kind of way with, the supercross and the motocross and the nascars and and everything that they do in sport there they've got so many spectators that there's the you know there's 90 percent you know supporting one guy and 10 percent supporting the other guy and it's a healthy competition and it gets things going um i do think that we've lost that little bit of finesse in in south africa and southern african racing because i think everything's a little bit about the manufacturer instead of about the the rider and the manufacturer you know everybody everybody's judging judging the machines instead of judging the riders and stuff so I definitely think that we could we could do with getting that back in that healthy competition of a little bit of rivalry and a little bit of betting going on, like oh my guy's going to beat your guy kind of thing. Um, but you know, I think it's just a it's just the way it goes. I think it's up and down. I think uh, you know I've seen motorsport for many many years in in Southern Africa up and down, and uh, yeah, I think I think we will get back to to that kind of atmosphere. But uh, you know, even with the current times, it's really difficult to do that. But I think it's it's definitely gonna gonna get there. So I, I actually have a disclaimer, Patrick. So I spoke to a colleague of mine today uh, in Botswana, and I told her I'm, I'm chatting to, to Ross tonight. She said, "Ross, do you know Ross?" And she said, "You're talking to one of the Botswana. And he's a hero. He's, a, he's an absolute hero." So I know for sure if you talk about heroes and villains, Ross is a hero in Botswana. It's, it's <laughs> so, so, so to Patrick's question. Just in Botswana, how do we develop motorsport in Botswana? Because in, we always refer to it in, in a South African context. What's happening in Botswana? Yeah, Botswana is growing, growing incredibly well. You know, um, Botswana motorsport is is doing well. And, uh, you know, for the first time in my life, I've, I've lived here my whole life since I was three days old. And, uh, you know, at the end of last year, I went to go watch a race because it was a bit too close to the to race. Um, and I went to go watch and we had 27 juniors, I think. That's, that's an incredible amount of, of junior riders. And, uh, you know, my part of, of giving back is I'm trying to arrange a little bit of riding schools, you know, just on a Saturday for, for a couple of hours just to give back a little bit and, and to try and just, uh, you know, see the guys that want to do the racing and, and show them that anything's possible. I mean, a, a guy from Joaneng that nobody's really heard of has gone and done an international race, which is no matter the result, whether it's good or yeah. bad, uh, you know, I still made it to the Dakar rally and, and start and finish, which was, 
which was incredible. So I think that's my main goal is to just try to show people that it's possible. And somebody from Joining, a, a small little town in the middle of Botswana that, that nobody knows about can, can go and fly our flag high, you know. So I try to give back as much as I possibly can. And uh, I think Botswana's got a lot of talent. Um, you know, it's unfortunate the, the sport is, is not well recognized yet, but it's the same as, you know, any African country, it's still taking a while to develop. Um, so I think we've got a way to go with, with uh, making it recognized. But a lot of the private sector are coming to the party at the moment. And uh, it's incredible to see, you know, we're getting a lot of juniors that are getting sponsored already at, at a young age where, I got my first sponsor when I got into a 125 at like 16 years old. So I think we're moving in the right direction and I, I'm really happy with the way that we're going. And uh, like I say, I think uh, I think the whole of South Africa has got so much talent and, and you know, we just got to, we just got to believe in ourselves. I think that's a big thing yeah. and, and not worry about anything else. You know, I have to worry a lot about money, but you know, we put it behind us and said, okay, well, if we're in debt, let's give it a go. We just got to, we've got one <laughs> shot at this. Let's go for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, you, you laugh about it now, Ross, but how close were you to actually, well, give it up after the second Dakar? Um, yeah, I was, I was, I'd already much, uh, pretty much given up, you know. Um, I had a, a lot of really good sponsors on board for both my Dakars that, that helped me cover the cost of pretty much everything. And, uh, you know, after the second year, they, they came to me before the, before I even raised the second Dakar and they said, listen, Ross, we've, we've reached our, our maximum limit now. So, uh, either we've got to cut our budget or we've just got to make a plan to, to, um, you know, look at a different scenario. So I pretty much, you know, those guys had, had taken everything on for two years and they'd done everything for me and, and like without them, I wouldn't have been able to go to Dakar. So I pretty much decided that listen we're going to just uh do some national racing and and that's going to be it and luckily enough i had this this option you know yamaha phoned me let's say last minute and said listen do you want to be a part of the team and uh i jumped at the opportunity and yeah then i thought to myself well we've got one more shot <laughs> let's go for it <laughs> I, I can't i can't see the second option being a bad one if i may i would love to touch on the fact that uh, what you do for what you did for a living before becoming a professional rider yeah. um as as a pilot uh, i can't can't imagine many or, or much better um or, or professions to be in uh, than flying across beautiful countryside yeah it's uh I've got a dream job without a doubt, you know. <laughs> um, I'm supported by a company called Mackie, and they were actually one of my main sponsors as well to go over to Dakar. Um, an incredible okay. company. Um, I got my commercial license about six or seven years ago, and I went up to them. I said, Listen, I can't fly full time because I race motorbikes. And they, they were like, What? You race motorbikes? You want to fly airplanes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it took a while to get in there, but, uh, you know, I started flying for Mackie and, uh, yeah, we, we're really good friends and, um, they said to me, listen, Ross, uh, we fully support your racing. So whenever you need time off to racing, you go race and whenever you're not racing, you can fly. So I was extremely lucky sure. and, uh, they helped me out big time and uh, I had a job with them. I still fly for them till today. I still fly with them. Um, obviously, the racing, when I'm racing, I obviously can't go and fly. So so I'm not tied down to a job that I have to be at every day, which is amazing. And I still keep I still fly a lot of tourists around. And um, yeah, it's it's great fun. And I love flying. You know, it's an incredible feeling being up in there, especially over the Okavango Delta, which is sure. probably the one, one of the most beautiful places in the world. Um, and I, I'm lucky enough to fly people and show them my beautiful country and then on the weekends go and race my motorbike through the bush at the same speed that I fly airplane yeah. at. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is if you, once you've won the car, you can be, you'll be flying all over the country with your own airplane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep that dream alive for a while. <laughs> uh, you know, um, it's amazing how quickly time goes by. Uh, we've already exceeded our hour once again. Um, I don't know. Are you are, are you guys in a rush, or can we carry on for a while still? Yeah, I've got a couple of minutes. There's no problem. Yeah, because this this is actually becoming quite an enjoyable evening now. And, and thanks for your time, Ross. We really appreciate it. It's, no, it's, it's amazing what social that. media does. It makes the world so much smaller. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible a few years ago, and we have to thank 
our behind the scenes guy yes. is a Kyle Bush and he's not from NASPA. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he's got a lot of computer knowledge and he's put the system together. And uh, yeah, I think the, the result is there for everyone to see. And, and it's an absolute privilege to have somebody mm -hmm. like you take the time to chat to us. Um, and hopefully we are reaching a lot of future Ross Branch fans as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, that's uh, that's the main goal is, is you know, unfortunately with sports and any athletes, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what sport you're involved in, that your career is not is very limited. So definitely I'd like to pass it down to, to kids and to guys that want to, you know, um, take the opportunity and go for it. So, yeah, um, you know, to all the kids and to everybody watching, please just uh, feel free to message me if you have any information. If you want to get going to Dakar, if it's one of your dreams to do it, then please feel free to message me. And I can just tell you how I did it. I'm not an expert at it yet, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm there to, to give that kind of information. And I, I love to see people succeed. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day we can we can be at the top of the podium on Dakar and, uh, you know, show everyone that it is possible. And uh, that's definitely the end goal. But uh, like I say, just to everybody watching to thank you so much for all the support and uh yeah to you guys it's uh, been incredible and yeah i i loved being on the show on, on on another side of the coin we all from a rallying background and tomorrow um the guy that actually created this whole system uh abdul said is uh, presenting a car gym corner at the kalani international raceway now, that's basically an auto test or, a, or a, a car park special stage. The concept is to try and get driver and navigator to communicate, um, much like you trying to read a screen at high speed. These two have to actually chat to each other <laughs> and find the route, um, whilst at the same time trying to do that against the stopwatch. Um, but it's attracting 40, 40 entries tomorrow, so it's quite healthy down here. And it's picking up quite nicely again. We've had a, we've been fortunate in having a very successful series with it. Unfortunately, COVID and uh, a lot of rigmarole uh, put put pay to many events. But it's nice to see grassroots motorsport growing again. And I think once again, that's the important element: is we need new blood in the sport. We need the future. Ross branches must start today. Um, yeah. And it's great to see somebody like you take the time out to encourage people to come and start off at those levels and, and build their own reputation going forward. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so great to see. And, uh, you know, especially especially local motorsports, it's so good to see it growing and the numbers growing. And like I said, the last race last year in Botswana was incredible to see the numbers growing. So I think all in all, although that we're going through such tough times with COVID, the pandemic and everything like that, I think it's still... You know, there's still so many people that love motorsports. So I think it's really cool and really important for, for everyone that can to stay safe, but also get out there and support support our local events. I, I think it's it's extremely important. The, 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 everybody's all, always going on about road safety. Um, I also believe that motorsport is a, has a, a purpose in that respect. In the sense, keep the youngsters off the road, get them involved in, in the grassroots level of motorsport, get them not only just to compete and try and get a result, but being there and actually competing gives them an opportunity to learn something about himself as a person or herself as a person, as well as getting to know their car and their, their abilities behind the wheel. Um, it's not always just winning and losing. Well, I, I, I certainly believe that if you participate in any of these events, you are winning already. You don't have to go home with a trophy to feel satisfied at the yeah. end of the day that you've given it your best shot and you've learned something from it. Um, even at your level, I'm sure every time you come back from an event, you've learned something new. Yeah, without a doubt. I think uh, most people especially... Um, you know, it's never ending. I think you learn you learn something new. And like I say, with rally racing, I'm still a, a real beginner and uh, I've still got a lot to learn. So it's going to be a long couple of years. But um, I definitely think that uh, when you do do whatever you're going to do, whether, you know, it's on a car, in a car, on a bike, uh, on a quad, whatever it is on is is take as much as you can from that event, you know, especially if you're not winning. If you're not winning, um, then is learn as much as you possibly can because that's the only way you're going to get better and, and go to the front a lot quicker. So um, for sure, it's it's really important to start at grassroots level as well. Uh, road safety-wise, I'm a big believer. You know, I lost my best best friend on a road bike uh, in a traffic accident. So 
So I'm definitely a guy that says, please go and learn as much as you possibly can in a controlled environment and, and you know, be responsible with, with getting in either a high-powered car or a bike or anything like that and just look after yourself. You know, it's uh, you've only got one life and it can get taken away really easily. So definitely grassroots level, go and learn as much as you possibly can because when you do get on out into the main road and, and where you need to be safe, you know what to look for. And it's not often that it's actually yourself that's the problem. It's it's always somebody else that causes the issue. So for sure, um, I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. So we have a question. We have a question here. So, sorry, Patrick. And mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a relevant question. In, in, in terms of this year past, so especially in the Toyota team, we had Hink that, that came on board. We have uh, Samir and then obviously the traditional Jindil. Um, the South Africans, and, and then there was also the, the century racing team, uh, Brian, and, and those kind of teams. What do you think about the, the Southern Africa competitors, the, the speed, and, and also how they compete on, on that international level? Um, I have no doubt that, uh, that they can win, with, without a doubt. Um, I think we saw with, with Hanks a couple of stages before he had his crash, and uh, you know, Janil obviously being a, a hero of South Africa, and mm -hmm. then yeah. Brian, who came out of nowhere, and all of a sudden yeah. he entered at the last minute and was running in the top. And you know, all of those guys I was lucky enough to go and talk to during the rally, and especially after my bike uh, broke down, I went to go and speak to them. And it's so good to see the sportsmanship between us Southern African guys. That, that everybody is just edging each other on, you know, even like Brian and Hank, who, who are big competitors with Janil, you know, um, everybody gets on and everybody was, was so excited for each other. And like I say, um, you know, Brian amazed me how, how fast he was. And definitely we, we've got winners, uh, without a doubt. You know, we do need the things to go right, for sure. Um, you know, there's, there was a lot of things that happened for us all, all as, a, as a whole team. Um, all of us, you know, uh, we had things go wrong. But if things go right, then I think the rest of the world's in trouble. <laughs> we, we actually, uh, that, that was Hen uh, Henry Kiena asking that question. And I think he's just busy psyching out the opposition here because they've also got plans to, to do the car in the near future. I don't know anything what you're talking about. <laughs> I'll put a disclaimer on that. <laughs> so, so maybe for the purpose of the audience, we have Brian and, and, and Ty next week um, on the show also. Um, and then we'll talk about um, the decor in the car. And especially from, from Ty's perspective, where she, where she transitioned from a motorbike into a car. Um, in actual fact, earlier to, tonight, uh, before the show, Patrick and I, we were, we were chatting and I said to him, you know, Ross is doing so well, but is the natural transition going to be going into a car? What's next, you know? <laughs> 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 and, 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 and I will allow Patrick to give you his version or his answer to me, but um, <laughs> what is what wow. is your thoughts on that? <laughs> um. Yeah, that would be a dream come true. Definitely, it's it's in the pipeline. Uh, you know, it's really difficult to get into a car, especially with the cost of, of going to do these rallies. Um, I have started talking to a couple of guys to see if I could do a couple of test drives. So hopefully soon we can get, get one of those going just to see. You know, it's not all guys that go from bikes to cars are, are good enough to go and compete. And obviously, we'd like to go and compete at... At a, at a good level, not just to, to go to the finish line. So I would love to do it. For sure, it's um, it's a dream of mine. And I think it's a natural transition for, for many riders that they like to go to cars. So, yeah, hopefully this year we can get a test drive in one or two of them and just see where we're at and, and see if it's possible because then we've got a good couple of years while I'm, while I'm still racing bikes to you know to do one or two races in a car and see see how we can we can move forward and get into into car racing but um yeah it's definitely the plan um you know i think uh brian's a, a great example coming from a quad and yeah. uh like i say his first deck on a car did a did an amazing job a, a really incredible job and 
Um, I think I was, I know what it was like because I was there uh, for the last couple of days just watching and I saw how fast he was going and I was just like, oh, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> so I understand what he what he had to put himself through to, to get those kind of results and I think it was incredible. But uh, like I say, even Henk, um, he's the, the incredible oh, athletes and I definitely think Southern Africa um, has a winner in the car category soon again. You know, I think it's it's on the verge of happening. So it'll be really cool if we can all combine in the same year. But uh, we just got to play our car right. <laughs> it's actually quite a, quite a phenomenal sight to see the involvement from a South African perspective, not only from com from competitors, even behind the scenes. The the actual fact that those Toyotas come from South Africa, I'm sure yeah. in the new year we're going to see Terence Marsh and the Nissans back, and the and the Woolridge Fords are going to be back. Um, there's so much, now and and now the uh, Century City cars. Um, well, I, I would risk saying that the top ten could be all South African next year. Yeah, without that, um, they're huge, you know, and it's it's really good to see. And uh, as I've said many times, we've got so much talent, and you know, it doesn't just mean the drivers or the navigators or or the riders. Um, you know, our whole country is, has got incredible things to, to have our Toyotas leading and then the century coming in now this for the first year and doing so well. Um, yeah, and Redland, you know, I was also there when when they were there and uh, it's incredible to see how much you know, scope we have throughout the, the whole field. So, yeah, I, w I wouldn't be surprised in the next couple of years, if not next year, that we have a top 10 for sure. Like uh, everybody's just a South African manufacturer for sure. But uh, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be good to see. And I think 2022 is going to be an interesting Dakar. Well, once again, I think we could carry on all night, but I would like to ask you, Ross, um, that we do this uh, maybe at regular intervals. Um, maybe before and or after your next international visit or whatever the case might be. We'd love to see you come back on this program whenever you feel like it. Uh, it has been lovely talking to you and uh, we, we are all rooting for you. Uh, without a doubt, we would love to see you come back with that trophy next year. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. And uh, I've loved being on the show and I hope I didn't talk too much because it's been an hour and a half now. But... Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, if it, no, if but it's up to us, we'll be so, here till so the morning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much for having me on the show, and I'd love to be back. Uh, we've got a couple of world championship rounds lined up, um, just depending on COVID, but uh, I'll definitely keep in touch, and I'd love to be back on the show. Thank you very much, Kyle and, and Clint. Thank you for you guys, and uh, I trust our listeners enjoyed this as much as we did. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah, no. No, so thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Ross. It was an absolute pl pleasure chatting to you and very humbling um, to be able to chat to you uh, because, you know, <laughs> you sit on the other side and say, ah, oh, the, the guys from Deco and that. So um, I really enjoyed it. So uh, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful evening. Have a good weekend. And to all the listeners, thank you guys for listening in and uh, we'll catch up with you guys really soon. Okay, perfect. Thanks, James. Oh, my God.